Okay, welcome back to Mindful Moments. So last week's episode was part one of our live, our live encounter. And uh, this is part two. So I want to again thank our uh, audience tonight and wanted to talk a little bit about what that practice was like and also want to do some questions and answers. So how's everyone doing with this notion of letting go of the last year and coming into the new year in a mindful, intentional way? And what questions do you all have for us about that process and about that practice that we just did? I have a question. It's a broader question. You know, there's so many different approaches to mindfulness and there could be, you know, guided meditation where you're like feeling different parts of your body or so many other things. So why do you choose this? I thought it was very good. I really liked, um, I thought it was really helpful to think about what I wanted to let go of and what I what I gained from each quarter of the year and from the whole year. I really liked that process. But how how do you why do you choose this approach to mindfulness? And is that not clear or is it yeah, no, no, it's that's clear. Very clear. We're trying to figure out if the other one wants to speak. Go ahead. Well, you you're the one who made up that meditation. I really like that one because you know, one of my therapeutic pet peeves is when people say, oh, you have to let that go or just let go of that, but nobody ever tells you how. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's this, this shaming element to letting go of something like we're supposed to just be able to, you know, drop it <laughs> and, and then it's gone. And it's not like that. Letting go is actually a process. And, you know, just touching something lightly instead of clinging to it or pushing it away you know, letting ourselves, like going through a guided meditation, letting ourselves touch back into whatever occurred, positive, negative, neutral things we'd forgotten or whatever, and just touching that lightly with our awareness and then moving on is building that muscle of, you know, the muscle of letting go. Um, oh. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Talking about letting go of experiences and um, as opposed to feelings. Yeah, or anything could be feelings too of, of bringing up that feeling and just touching it lightly with awareness and then letting it go. Um, body centered and somatic meditations can be really great and I really enjoy them. But if you're working with people who have active unprocessed trauma, it's not always the best way to go to let someone loose in their body. Um, it might not be safe for them to be embodied. And so they might be safer just, you know, in, in the world of their cognition. Um, so there, there are lots of different things to consider when we decide what kind of mindfulness practice to do. You know, who is the audience? Who are we on any given day? What mm. are we working on? Um, maybe not working on, but what are we being with? And what are we trying not to be with? So, you know, those are, those are also excellent questions, Cynthia. Thank you. Yeah. Well, and can I build on that? Yeah, a little please. Um, I love that, that point you made about um, just let it go, just let it go. I remember when I was about uh, 19 or 20, uh, my, my first really, really major long-term relationship had ended. Um, You've had other people in your life besides me. It was, it was, it was a long time ago. <laughs> This is worth noting. It was a long time. I'm, I'm not kidding, 22. Of no, I'm just kidding. You know that. So anyway, sorry. like I was when we met. Yeah. Uh... It's true that that's how long we've known each other. Um, no, so I I was really heartbroken, and I had been abroad for a semester, and the relationship had ended while I was gone. So I was already missing this person, and then. Um, the relationship ended while I was gone. And so I was really adrift for a couple months. And then I thought when I came back, well, maybe we can reconcile. And then there was this one conversation where it looked like we were gonna reconcile. And then at the very end, kind of the floor dropped out of the, the reconciliation. And it was just really hard. And I was in college with this person. And so I saw them around, very small campus. I saw them around all the time. And I remember one of my friends just kept saying to me, let it go. You have to let go, let go, let go, let go. And I remember one night I just said, him, I can't. <laughs> you know, like that was, I mean, it was so easy to let go. I would just let go. Why would you torture yourself? Yeah. But we, something about being human is attachment. You know, we get attached to things. 
So for me, the main thing that I'm focused on letting go of is my story because I can't really change my body sensations and I can't change my heartache and I can't change my grief. Uh, I can't change my, my love and my joy either. So as a meditation teacher, I just think a lot about letting go of the story. And the reason why we do this, this annual meditation and the reason why we do a, a weekly meditation twice at the beginning of the week and at the beginning of the weekend is that uh, we want to let go of the story that we have about what is past. So we will we'll always have a recollection of what is past, but a lot of story about, oh, it was so great. Or narrative. A narrative. About it. Yeah. Or it was so awful. I mean, because that ties into the notion of suffering, right? So um, we're going to have difficulties and challenges in life. That's one of the Buddha's core teachings. And, and one of the ways we suffer is when we don't get our way. And then we dwell on that. The other way we suffer is when things go great. Mm. I had the greatest weekend ever. And now I'm back at work. Mm. Or, you know, wow, I had a great weekend. I really crushed it at work. And now, you know, I have this weekend where I have to like rake a lot of leaves or whatever it is. We have to let go of what was and so we can be fully with what is. And the reason why we do the intention is uh, right on page one of the Dhammapada, which is the seminal sayings of the Buddha text. Uh, he says, the very first thing he says is, your life follows your mind like a cart follows a horse. So uh, if you have an intention, if you have a, a direction, you're directing your mind in a certain way, your life just naturally follows. If you develop virya, discipline, you know, and, and if you're, you're able in your daily meditation every day to remind yourself of what your, your intention is, then you don't get knocked about quite as much. So like, for example, my intention this week was to go with the flow. That's the intention that I set <laughs> on my day. See, she's laughing because we've had a really challenging week. She's been sick. I just got COVID vaccine, so I don't feel very good. Uh, our son's been home for, for break, but we can't go anywhere or do anything because of coronavirus. We've got all kinds of stuff going on at work. And, you know, that has been very helpful. There's been a number of times that I've started to get aggravated this week. And I've reminded myself that, well, your intention was to go with the flow. So this is the flow. Let's not create a bunch of story about it. Like, let's deal with what we need to deal with. So, so the reason that I'm a big fan of that particular type of meditation of kind of cleaning the karma of the past, getting fully present, pondering the future and, and setting some intentions um, is that it, it just helps me to carry on down the path some, somewhat less encumbered with what was behind on the path and with a clear vision forward of what is coming and how to stay out of the brambles and thickets and, and kind of stay on that path of my life. So that's what, that's what I like about it. Well, so I don't want, I don't want to just take up, but if it's, I think that's interesting. And I mean, it really worked when we were doing it for me. And at the same time, I think that you can't, it's not, it's also like if you have feelings that are not, that you don't want to have, you can't, push them away. You can't just let go of them. You have to kind of give care to them. And then they do, then they move through you. And exactly. So it kind of goes together, but it's not exactly what you were saying, I don't think. Well, you know, trying to let go get in creates, the way. Yeah, trying to let go creates more attachment. You're absolutely right. You have to accept how you are and how you're feeling. Right. Um, for sure. Okay. It's not about letting go of that. It's about letting go of, okay, that already happened. And the story and not trying to go back to it and then being with a kind of on that wheel like right now we're on the wheel of 2020 yeah. almost over 2021 has not started uh you know if it's a friday i'm on the wheel between the week and the weekend it's not that i'm not affected by what happened in the last few days or in the last year it's that i'm i'm not trying to let go of what occurred or how i feel about it I'm trying to let go of my story about it. Right, right. The thought brings me more fully into the moment. And what is happening in the moment, maybe right. that I feel sick, agitated, stressed, angry, fearful, lonely, whatever. Okay. And that is important to accept because that, that acceptance gives you a springboard for what the intention is. Yeah. Because if I'm feeling sad, maybe my intention is to accept my sadness and to cultivate and, and be kind to myself 
uh, cultivate loving kindness. Um, well, and trauma is caused by the incompletion of the energy of emotion or something that, that has occurred, you know, our inability to complete that cycle. So pushing feelings away doesn't allow us to complete that cycle, right? So we, we do want to be able to feel our feelings. Absolutely. I think that's, you know, one of the, one of the great, um, issues that human beings face right now is that we are fed this line of crap that we're always supposed to be cheerful and positive mm -hmm. and that if we just have positive thinking everything will be okay and it's really toxic it's just it's not realistic it's very shaming it just it isn't true and so <laughs> then if we end up with like psychosomatic issues or you know trauma that hasn't processed through then it becomes our fault <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. so then there's a layer of suffering on top of suffering, right. which is really like such a huge problem and, and so unnecessary, you know, so really retraining ourselves to feel what we feel in the moment is, or even if we can't feel it in the moment as it arises, you know, sometimes I've worked with people and they say, well, you know, I really just need to be present and helping them understand that what they think being present means or isn't really what it means. So whatever's up for them is what's present. Right. And that it, they don't have to get somewhere else to be present. They just have to be present to what's happening. I need to get rid of my sadness so I can be present. Right. It's like, <laughs> well, you're present and you're sad. Like, yeah. it's fine. Yeah. The problem is the story, not the experience. Right. Because the story intimates that it should be different. And that gets us out of our lives and causes us, I love what you said about suffering on top of suffering, that there's what's happening. And then there's all the extra story that we create that hurts us more. And, you know, if you're stressed, just be stressed. I remember one time hearing, uh, uh, you know, my old teacher, one of his students, we were having kind of a group discussion and, and this particular person, an architect, was being sued over a job that didn't go well. And his basic position more or less was, it is so wrong and unfair that I'm being sued. And I remember my teacher saying to him, if you're being sued, just really be sued. <laughs> you know, not that it's fun to be sued, but it will pass and you need to be fully in it, not trying to get out of it, not trying to, because he was wasting a lot of energy with all of his stories about how wrong it was and how it shouldn't be that way. And there's nothing you can do about it. You know, if, if, there's no point in complaining if you can change what's happening. And there's also no point in complaining if you can't change what's happening. Right. You know, we, we just need to be with what's happening. That's, right. that's the entryway into uh, more calm, more serenity, more peace. Um, you know, another analogy, I'm sort of rambling, but another analogy is there was this uh, Zen master whose child passed away and he spent many, many, many months just weeping on the cushion during Zazen, during meditation. One of his students said to him, Master, you're always saying that life is just an illusion. Why are you crying so much about your child? And the master said, it's a very painful illusion. Mm. You know? There's a great story about the Dalai Lama walking through an, through an airport and he saw this woman who was sitting in a chair, just crying her eyes out, just bawling. And he sat down with her and he, you know, he pulled her close and he has this way of like going head to head and putting his hand on her head. And he just cried and cried and cried Can and cried and more? cried. Yeah. I like that. Did you like that? <laughs> cried and cried and cried with her and held her and cr cried. And then she was kind of cried out and he just got up and walked off and with his entourage and his people were like, what was that? <laughs> <laughs> like he didn't talk to her about it at all? No. I love that. And he didn't explain it. Then when the crying was over, it was over. And he just got out. He and, just dipped. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. And his people who had been around him all this time were like. <laughs> <laughs> well, they shouldn't have been has, surprised. No, right? I know. It's just like the, a, a little kid. They have a tantrum and then it's over. Right. And they're not like telling the story about it or whatever, you know? So well, we have emotions this... are energy, you know? And they're, and they're from, from a mindfulness-based perspective our emotions are part of our enlightenment you know it's it's information it's communication it's our emotions are important oh hi kitty <laughs> well 
Well, I'm glad the cat showed up in that yeah, moment. Yeah, me too. That was great. You know, it's, it's, we have a dog. A few dogs. We, have, dog. we have dogs here, and one mm -hmm. of them is this three-legged little hopscotcher who just walks around, and, like, she just hobbles along and does her best, but she doesn't have, she doesn't appear anyway to have a big story about how unfair it is. The cat doesn't appear to be having a big story about anything, you know, so, and, but the goal is not to be like an animal because we're not, we're, we're human beings. You know, we, we have, you know, one of the things they say that differentiates humans and animals is that we have the ability to uh, understand cause and effect. So, you know, these things happen, now this is happening, and then this thing is going to happen. And, you know, um, that is both a blessing and a curse, really. Because, you know, another thing that, that the Buddha says in the Dhammapada in that first section is, you know, look how he beat me, how he threw me down and robbed me. Live in these thoughts and live in pain. Look how he beat me, how he threw me down and robbed me. Abandon these thoughts and live in peace. You know, so what he's saying is, maybe that happened and maybe you need to deal with that it happened but it but how often do we continue telling the story over and over you know as therapists this is something we think about a lot too that if you don't tell the story at all then it's just stuck in your body and it, it can't somaticize it can't move if you tell the story and then you keep telling the story you're almost training your body to stay in that heightened state so you need to do nonverbal therapy to process the trauma and also um, once you understand the story, we do need to let go of the story and be in the moment. So, Tracy, what are your thoughts? I have a flip side question, I guess. Um, I was very eager to let a lot of things go from 2020, as most of us are. But there were a few very, very lovely moments that I felt mm. my presence even, like my chin went up. I smiled a little bit. Um, is there a way to hold on to those moments or do we also have to let those go? I, I will uh, give you a different answer than Josh will. Okay. So, you, well, maybe the same You want answer, me to give my different. answer and then you can well, say you if it's gave, we, I, I did this and you did this. <laughs> no, wait, opposite. You, <laughs> you were like, maybe you can't hold on to it. And I was like, yes. You wouldn't make a very good bobblehead. No, I wouldn't. I didn't know that was an option. <laughs> So, okay, go ahead, um, go ahead. Well, one of the things I do a guided meditation with our with our clients where we um, do a version of the Maitri Bhavana, which is the development of loving kindness. But what I have them do is call to mind someone that they really admire and they really look up to. It could be, you know, a sports figure or a celebrity, or it doesn't matter who it is, a family member, whatever. And I have them tell, you know, in their imagination, tell that person everything that they admire about them and how thankful they are for how they've shaped their lives and, you know, all of that. And, and that celebrity hero, whoever it is, is really present with it. And there's no kind of, you know, snobbery or, or condescension or anything. And they're really taking it in and that you can tell that it's really like filling them up. And then the sports figure, celebrity person, whoever it is, says, um, thank you so much. You've really touched me. And I want you to be happy, well, and free from suffering. Hmm. That's what I want for you. And then I have people go from, from that situation to a safe, happy place for themselves where they just, it could be somewhere in nature, it could be somewhere in their home where they're with their favorite person, their favorite animal, you know, and they really practice feeling good. Like really just sink into that good feeling. Because the fact of the matter is that we are, we have access to and are inundated with more information in one day than people in Shakespeare's lifetime had in their entire lives their entire lives. So we are running a limbic stress mm. response so much of the time that it's actually really important that we practice treasuring those beautiful, joyful mm. moments, you know, and part of what's beautiful and joyful about them is that they pass. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's part of what makes it so poignant and so precious is that I'm going to get like weepy, but those things pass, you know? Yeah. 
So, but it is, it's so important for us to keep those, those neural pathways thick and strong and remembering how to feel good. Really important for our health, for our well being, for our, you know, anti aging, whatever it is, for our evolution, I think. I love that you get so poignant about those things, even after all these years of practice and living. Even after. <laughs> no, the more you practice, the more you feel that way. Well, but a lot of people get cynical and get, you know, they're yeah. not fresh. Yeah. I actually want to elaborate on the answer that I didn't give, but that Maureen thought I would give. <laughs> um, again, you know, it's not about letting go of the feelings or the remembrance. You know, it's like Maureen was saying, it's just appreciating it and just letting go of the story and especially letting go of the story of why is that not still happening? I deserve for it still to be happening. It's never going to happen again. There's no point in even trying to have a good experience if it's just going to leave, you know, those kinds of things. So yes, important to let go of those stories, but um, I think it's, critical, like you said, to, to remember the good things. That's one of the reasons why we do the review too, is to appreciate what is good. And when we handle things well and to notice, oh, that could have really thrown me off a year ago and it didn't this time, yeah. or, you know, oh, you know, 2020 did have some really nice moments. I appreciate the reminder about that because I think it did. I think anyone who's paying attention has some good things that have happened over the course of 365 days, I mean, one hopes, right? So, you know, I think we're very aligned on this topic. Okay. And in fact. So, okay, so I have a different question. Like, when you talk about this, it made me think, I, a few times I should do it more. I've done some Qigong with Robert Peng, who's a great master, and some an ecstasy practice. And it feels like that's a different thing but you can actually it's not my own experience but I can actually feel wonderful after it mm -hmm. and so that's how does something like that connect to what you're talking about you know just bringing because I don't I can don't even believe it while I'm doing it but then afterwards mm -hmm. I feel amazing yeah and that's not exactly like my own experience or my story maybe it's right. like, there is no story I don't, there's, I don't think there's any story I think it's just joy I don't think joy I think we can attach you know, I, I just think about like polyvagal theory. I think about that a lot and just how, you know, the stories that we make up are mostly based on physical sensations and the, the meaning that we ascribe to those sensations. Yeah. So the joy, the life force in our body, those people who've gone before us, who, who have spent, you know, their lifetime pondering and, and seeing through to the nature of things, that is our life force is joy and it's, it's sort of beyond love. It's beyond happiness. It's just this vibrating life force that we, as we say is joy. So what a, what a great experience to have Cynthia. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That, that some say that's our true nature. Right. I tend to believe that. Well, and I think also if you meditate long enough or do Qigong long enough or do a bicycle ride for long enough. Yeah. Anything that's soothing to the nervous system and that releases dopamine in the brain and that's soothing, yeah. uh, you're going to feel good, mm -hmm. you know? So um, I remember when I was studying Qigong in Boulder with Ken Cohen, who's pretty well-known Qigong uh, master and, and wrote a book about it, an amazing teacher. Uh, but I was going to miss some classes because I was going into a Zen retreat and I said, oh, I'm going to not see you for a while. I'm going to this meditation retreat. He said, well, meditation is Qigong, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, you know, it, yeah, it is just point. really a matter of, you know, and it's kind of interesting this morning when I, I did a long practice with the students this morning and I was really spaced out. Like a few times I was just like, I looked at them and they were like this. And I'm like really dialed in and I was just like thinking about all the different stuff that I've got going on and, you know, thinking about COVID and how are we dealing with things and whatever. And, you know, I had to kind of remind myself of what I always tell them, which is if you're sitting there spacing out or you're sitting there thinking about stuff, it's fine because you're sitting there, you're sitting there and you're, 
nervous not system is problems. yeah your nervous system is regulating and you're breathing and you're aware of what's going on even if what's going on is a bunch of you know didactic stuff so you can't you can't really lose and you're going to have that that ecstasy to some extent if you calm your mind enough and if you work with your body enough and, and your breath it just comes naturally what I have found is that if you set an intention for it, it will come more. But if you try to chase after it, it's sort of like a cat. Like if you run into a room and you're like, kitty, and you like run after the cat, what does a cat do? It runs under the bed. But if you kind of hold still and you're like, you know, and just you're welcoming. Cats, the more you ignore them. The more yeah, the cat will like come up to you and, yeah. and like kind of settle in. And yeah. so. Yeah, interesting. It's interesting. Yeah, but it's it's the polyvagal. I mean, it is the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system and all that stuff that is affected by all these things, I guess. Yeah, you know, in homeostasis, when when we're when we're activating our our parasympathetic nervous system in homeostasis, that's when our cells can clean up disease and you know all of that. Our cells can do what they do, and they're not just bathed in cortisol and epinephrine mm -hmm. and adrenaline and you know all of that it can actually heal mm -hmm. us and and i think that that is our life force in action too interesting yeah 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 too much norepinephrine and your brain just gets really <laughs> <laughs> just really it's not good for you <laughs> oh my god yeah good yeah job. I'm going to get my brain spotting pointer out again. <laughs> <laughs> she was, she was poking me with it during, during the meditation, trying Just to test, one time, test my concentration. Um, we have about seven minutes left in our time. Um, other questions, comments? I want to hear about the anti-aging part. <laughs> Marie, <laughs> I perked up on that one. Yeah. <laughs> what so do I need? Tell me what yeah. I mean. <laughs> you, don't need a thing. you don't need a thing. You don't you actually don't age ever. So I don't know. You tell us. What what are you doing? <laughs> I don't know. You didn't know I was 81 years old, did you? <laughs> I'm serious. I want to know. Yeah. So our um I mean, who really knows, but the, the theory is that in homeostasis, I don't know that we can reverse the aging process necessarily, but um, definitely slow it down because it's, you know, oxidation and decay and all of that. So if we're, if our internal environment is in a state of homeostasis and it's not being attacked, we can slow the aging process down. Yeah, they've actually done uh, studies of monks and just seen the way that long meditation changes your brain chemistry. And, um, my, my Zen teacher had terminal cancer and uh, was given a year to live and decided to stop doing chemotherapy. And that was six years uh, ago. That was six years ago. <laughs> you know, he, he uh, after- He's as ornery as ever. <laughs> at times. <laughs> After a year, you know, he, he was like, okay, well, I'm not dead yet. And then another year went by and they said, well, let's take a look at what's going on. And he had all of these little tumors that had congealed into one tumor. And they said, well, we still think you're going to die, but let's take the tumor out because you'll be more comfortable. And then he's cancer free and he has been for several years now. So, um, you know, I think there's something about again, slowing the body down. I mean, it's been well established that stress is the main cause of almost all illness. So cold, pneumonia, flu, cancer, whatever. Um, I, I don't know that this is true, but I'm guessing that if you catch COVID and you're pretty calm and regulated and happy and your body's in a good you know, state, you're more likely to fight it off than if you're completely exhausted and stressed and angry and sad and tired and all that stuff. Um, so I, I mean, I have to think in that particular anecdotal case that his acceptance of the situation somehow allowed his body to heal in a way that fighting it might not have. 
Um, well, and he was trained. I mean, I always go back to the neural pathways that he had trained his brain to be in a state of homeostasis in Zazen practice. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was his default mm -hmm. instead of it being stress and trying to fight yes. it. And, you know, not that we don't try to fight for our lives. I mean, definitely we do, but there's maybe that isn't what we think it is. Yeah, and when you look at him when he's meditating, he's not there. <laughs> there's no one there. Um, so so that, that training of being able to go so deep that, that you know, you're transcending the, the you or you're dropping, you know, mind and body drop away as a Zen saying. Um, you know, I think that a lot of, you know, first of all, there is a saying, and it, it is my nature to grow old, grow sick and die, which is kind of a bummer on the surface of it. Um, but I remember a teacher saying to me once that he found it very comforting because it was sort of like, well, I know what's going to happen. <laughs> I don't need to fight it. Um, I think I, there is an irony there. If you look at the Dalai Lama or like most aging monks or nuns of any tradition, I mean, Mother Teresa was beautiful when she was very, very elderly. And, and I think it's because that, you know, that sunlight of the spirit is shining through and our storylines and our negativity is, is not as dominant when we do these practices and when we connect with that, that divine energy and that, that divine essence that transcends our ego and our, our little brain. So and there's so much really interesting stuff happening in that front, um, using technology as well. So Dr. Joe Dispenza and um, Bruce Lipton and people like that are really doing some incredible stuff mm -hmm. with meditation and using technology to help you get into the state of homeostasis uh it's just phenomenal and so tr you know just really training your body and your mind to synchronize and be where you want them to be together so milton and i are too old to come to red mountain sedona but you could start a program for people who are older and want to stop the aging process. I think that's, that's a great idea. Fine. Absolutely. Yeah, I would love to do I that. Uh, just our little it retreat. Wouldn't, it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me if it comes to pass eventually. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be interesting. I mean, it, really. yeah, just like a week at a time would be really cool. And then we could have metrics and study the whole thing. There you go, Dr. White. Yeah. <laughs> I've been encouraging her to get her doctorate. You know, I think it's well time. well past time yeah well thank you all again so much for being here uh those thank of you, you that are watching this in the future hello from the year 2020 by the time <laughs> this posts i'm sure it will not be 2020 anymore um yes it was the year of the mask uh like I think that's over it's that movie uh i don't remember soylent green yeah <laughs> v for vendetta is what i was thinking oh about. yeah that was um good one. So thank you all at home for watching. And please, if you have any questions for us, email us, josh at redmountainprograms.com, maureen at redmountainprograms.com. We will take up your questions for future episodes. Uh, for our audience, I just want to thank you. Your questions are very dynamic and they do, you know, prompt a lot of dialogue. So email us as much as you want. You could ask us 10 questions and 10 episodes which is based on your questions. We would love nothing more than yeah. that. So um, remember to like and subscribe to the channel so that you know when we're dropping new episodes. And uh, I really want to thank Dira Ball, who's on camera right now. And if you enjoy Mindful Moments, you have Dira to thank because she she pushed us for a long time she to made do us. this. And I will say <laughs> that <you>, Dira. <laughs> I will say that one of the positives that has come out of COVID is that yeah. Maureen and I did start Mindful Moments during yeah, COVID. We, did. we finally had time. We weren't on the road so much at conferences and stuff, and we wanted to stay connected with all of you. So thank you, Dira, for that. And thank you, COVID, for that. And thank, thank you, 2020, for that. Yeah. You know, there's always something, something <laughs> positive to be found. So I uh, really appreciate all of you. It's great to see you all. And, thank you. Uh, thank you. you. Keep coming so back. So wonderful to see you all. Thank you for bringing your hearts and your minds. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate you all. Happy New Year. Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.